from around the globe. It's theCUBE, with digital coverage of Exascale Day, made possible by Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We are uh, celebrating Exadata Day. Uh, 1018, it's, I think it's the second year of celebrating Exadata Day. And we're really excited to have uh, our next guest and talk about kind of what this type of compute scale enables and really look a little bit further down the road at some big issues, big problems uh, and big opportunities that this is going to open up. And I'm really excited to get in this conversation with our next guest. He is Brian Pijanowski, the Professor of Landscape and Soundscape Ecology at Purdue University. Brian, great to meet you. Great to be here. So um, in getting ready for this um, conversation, you know, I just watched your, your TED talk and I just loved one of the quotes. I actually wanted to quote you from it. That's basically saying, you are exploring the world through sound. I just love to get, you know, a little deeper perspective on that because that's such a unique um, way to think about things. And you really dig into it and explain why this is such an important way to enjoy the world, to absorb the world and think about the world. Yeah, that's right, Jeff. So, you know, the way I see it, uh, sound is kind of like a universal variable. It exists all around us. And you, can, you can't even find a place on Earth where there's no sound, where it's completely silent. Uh, sound is a signal of something that's happening. And we can use that information in ways to allow us to understand the Earth. Uh, just, just thinking about all the different kinds of sounds that exist around us on a daily basis. I hear the birds. I hear the insects but there's just a lot more than that. It's mammals, in some cases, a lot of reptiles. And then when you begin thinking outside the bi biological system, you begin to hear rain, wind, thunder. Um, and then there's the sounds that we make, sounds of traffic, the sounds of church bells. All of this is information. Some of it's symbolic. Some of it's telling me something about change. As an ecologist, that's what I'm interested in. How is the earth changing? That's great. And then you guys set up at Purdue, the Purdue Center for Global Soundscapes. Um, tell us a little bit about the mission and, and some of the work that you guys do. Well, our mission is, is really to use uh, sound as, as a lens to study the earth, uh, but to capture it in ways that are meaningful and to bring that back to the public, to tell them a story about how the earth kind of exists. There's an incredible awe of nature that we all experience when we go out and listen into the wild spaces of the earth. Um, you know, I've gone to the Eastern steppes of Mongolia, I've climbed towers in uh, the paleotropics of Borneo and listened at night <laughs> and asked the question, how are these sounds different? And what is a grassland really supposed to sound like, you know, without humans around? So we use that information and bring it back and and analyze it and analyze it as, as a means to understand how the earth is changing and really what the biological community is all about and how things like climate change are, are altering our spaces, our wild spaces. Um, I'm also interested in the role that people play in producing sound and also using sound. So uh, getting back to Mongolia, we have uh, a new NSF funded project where we're going to be studying herders and the ways in which they use sonic practices. They use a lot of sounds as information sources about how the environment is changing, but also how they uh, relate back to place and to, and to heritage. It's special sounds that resonate. The, the, the sounds of a, of a river, for example, are the resonance patterns that they tune their throat to, that pay homage to their parents that were born at the side of that river. There's these special connections that people have with place through sound. And so that's another thing that we're trying to do. Um, uh, in really simple terms, I wanna go out and what I call, it sounds rather simple, record the earth. Right. What does that mean? I wanna go to every major biome and conduct a research study there. I wanna right. know what does a grassland sound like? What does a coral reef sound like? A kelp forest in the oceans, a desert. And to capture that, as baseline and use that information yeah. for scientific purposes. You know, there, there's so much to unpack there, Brian. You know, first off is just kind of the foundational role that sound plays in our lives, which you outlined uh, in great detail. And, you know, you talked about it's the first sense that's really activated as we get consciousness, even before we're born, right? We hear the sounds 
of our mother's heartbeat and 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 her voice and and even the last sense that goes uh, at the end a lot of times in, in this really uh, intimate relationship as you just said that the sounds represent in terms of of our history we don't have to look any further than you know a favorite song that can instantly transport you almost like a time machine to a particular place and time very very cool now what's really interesting that what you're doing now is taking advantage of of new technology and just kind of a new angle to capture sound in a way that we haven't done before. I think you've said, you know, you have sound listening devices oftentimes in a single location for a year. You're not only capturing sound, but right sound is, is changes in air pressure. So you're getting changes in air pressure, you're getting vibration, which is kind of a whole different level uh, of data. And then to be able to collect that for a whole year and then, you know, start to try to figure out a baseline, which is pretty simple to understand, but you're talking about this chorus. I love your phrase, a chorus, because that sound is made up of a bunch of individual inputs and now trying to kind of go under the covers to figure out what is that baseline actually composed of. And you talk about a bunch of really interesting particular animals and, and species that combine to create this chorus that now you know is a baseline. How did you used to do that before? I think it's funny, you, one of your, your uh, research papers, you reach out to the great bird bird callers and bird listeners, because as you said, that's the easiest way or the most prolific way for people to identify birds. So please help us in a crowdsource way, try to identify all the pieces uh, that make this beautiful chorus that is the soundscape for a particular area. Right. Yeah, that's that's right. You know, it, it really does take a team of scientists and engineers uh, and even folks in the social sciences and the humanities to really begin to put all of these pieces together. Um, you know, experts in many fields are extremely valuable that, you know, they, they've got great ears because that's the tools that they use to go out and identify birds or insects or, or amphibians. Uh, what we don't have are generalists that go out and can tell you what everything sounds like. And, and I'll tell you, that will probably never, ever happen. That's just way too much. We have millions of species that exist on this planet. <clears throat> and we just don't have a specific catalog of what everything sounds like. It's just, it's just not possible or doable. Uh, so I need, I need to go out and discover and bring those discoveries back that help us to understand nature and understand how the earth is changing. Uh, I can't wait for us to eventually develop that catalog. So we, we're, we're trying to develop techniques and tools and approaches that allow us to develop this, this electronic catalog, you know, like, you, like you're saying, this, this chorus and it doesn't necessarily have to be a species specific course and be a course of all these different kind of sounds that we think relate back to this kind of animal or that kind of animal based upon the animal's instrument right how it produces right. the sound now again you know keep it to the exascale theme right mm -hmm. you're collecting a lot of data and and you mentioned in one of the the pieces i've dug up you know that uh your longest study in a single location is 17 years You've got uh, over 4 million recordings. And I think you said over 230 years if you wanted to listen to them all back to back. I mean, this is a huge, a big data problem in terms of the massive amount of, of data that you have and need to, uh, to run through an, an analysis. Yeah, that's right. Uh, we're collecting 48,000 data points per second. Uh, so that's 48 kilohertz. And then so you multiply everything and then you have a sense of how many data points you actually have to put them all together. Um, when, you're, when you're listening to uh, a sound file over 10 minutes, you have hundreds of sounds that are, exist in them. Uh, oftentimes you just don't know what they are, but you can, you can you know, more or less put some kind of measure on, on all of them and mm -hmm. then begin to summarize them over space and time and and trying to understand it from a perspective of really science. Right, right. And then I just love to get your take on, you know, as you progress down this kind of identification road, you know, we're all very familiar with, you know, copyright infringement hits on YouTube or social media or whatever, when, you know, it picks up on some sound and, and the technology is actually really sophisticated to pick up some of those sound signatures. But to your point, it's a lot easier to compare against the known uh, and to search for that known than when you've got this kind of undefined chorus that said you know we do know that that there can be great analysis done that we've seen uh, ai and ml applied especially in the surveillance side on the video right. uh, with video that it can actually do a lot of uh, computation and, and a lot of um, extracting signal from the noise if you were as you look down the road on the 
compute side for the you know algorithms that you guys are trying to build uh, with the human input of, of people that know what they're listening to what kind of opportunities do you see and where are we on that journey where you can you know get more leverage out of some of these technology tools well i i think what we're doing right now is uh developing the the methodological needs uh, kind of describe what it is we need to move into that that new space which is going to require these you know computational uh that computational infrastructure so for example um we have a study right now where we're trying to identify uh certain kinds of mosquitoes <laughs> uh, uh vector borne mosquitoes and uh, our estimates are is that we need about maybe 900 to 1,200 specific recordings per species to be able to put it into something like a convolutional uh, uh, neural network to be able to extract out the information, look at the patterns and data to be able to say, indeed, this is the species that we're that that we're interested in. Uh, so, uh, so what we're going to need in in the future here is really a lot of information that allow us to kind of train these neural networks and help us identify what's in these sound files. Uh, as you can imagine, the computational infrastructure needed to do that for data storage and CPU, GPU is gonna be truly amazing. Right, right. So I wanna get your take on, on another topic. And again, the, the basis of your research is really all about around the biodiversity crisis, right? That was yeah. kind of the, the thing that's that started it. And now you're using sound as a way to measure baseline and and talk about you know uh, loss of species, uh, reduced abundances, and and rampant expansion of invasive species. Part of your mm -hmm. your core, but I'd love to get your take on on cities uh, mm -hmm. and and how do you think cities fit in the future? Clearly, it's an efficient way to get a lot of people together. There's a huge migration of people right. to cities, but you know one of your themes in your TED talk is reconnecting with nature because yeah. we're in cities. And, and but yeah. there's this paradox, right? Because you don't want you know people living in nature can be a little bit disruptive. So is it better yeah, yeah. to kind of get them all in the, in, in the tip of a peninsula in yeah, San yeah. Francisco or, yeah. but then do they lose that connection that's so yeah. important? I just love to get your, your take on cities and the impacts that they have on, you know, your core research. Yeah, I mean, it, it truly is a paradox as you just described it, you know, um, we're, we're living in a concrete jungle uh, surrounded by uh, not a lot of nature really honestly, uh, you know, occasional birds, bird species that tend to be fairly limited, uh, selected for urban environments. Uh, so many people just don't uh, get out and into the into the wild. Um, you know, visiting national parks certainly is one of those kinds of experience that people oftentimes have. But I'll, I'll just say that, you know, it's it's getting out there and truly listening and feeling this 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 emotional uh, feeling, psychological feeling that wraps around you, this, uh, this solitude. You know, it's just you and nature and, and there's just no one around. And right. that's when it really truly sinks in, that you're a part of this place, this marvelous place called Earth. And, and so there are very few people that have had that experience. And so as, as I've gone to some of these places, I say to myself, I need to bring this back. I need to tell this story tell the story of the awe of nature, because it truly is an amazing place, even if you just close your eyes and, and listen. Right, and, right. Uh, it, you know, the, the dawn course in the morning in every place tells me so much about that place. It tells me about all the animals that exist there. Uh, uh, the nighttime tells me so much too. You know, as, as, as a scientist that spent most of his you know, career kind of going out and working during the day, there's so much happening at night. Matter of fact, right. there's more sounds at night than there are during the day. So um, there, there is a need for us to experience nature and we don't do that. And we don't, we're not aware of these, uh, these crises that are happening all over the planet. You know, I do go to places and I listen and I can tell you, I'm listening for things that, are, that I think should be there. You know, you can listen, you can hear the gaps the gaps in that in that course and you think what 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 should be there right. and and then why isn't it there and that's where i i really want to be able to dig deep into my sound files and start to explore that more fully 
It's great. It's great. I mean, I, I just love the whole concept of, and you identified it in in the uh, in the moment you were in the tent, the thunderstorm came by. It's really just kind of changing your lens. Really, it's really twisting your lens, changing your focus, because that sound is there, right? It's been there all along. It's just do you tune it in or do you tune it out? Do you pay attention? Do you not pay attention? Is it an active process or a passive process? And I right. I love that perspective. But I want to shift gears a little bit because another big. Uh, a big environmental thing, and you mentioned it quite frequently, is feeding the world's growing population and feeding yeah. it in an efficient Absolutely. way. And and you know, anytime you see you know kind of factory farming applied to uh, a lot of things, um, you know, you wonder, you know, is it sustainable? And then all the issues that come from you know kind of single you know kind of single output production, whether that's pigs or coffee mm -hmm. or whatever, mm -hmm. and, and the susceptibility to disease and and this and that. So I wonder. You know, if you could share your thoughts on, you know, based on your research, what needs to change uh, to successfully and without too much destruction feed, you know, this in ever increasing population. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's one of the grand challenges. I mean, society is facing so many at the moment, uh, you know, in the next um, 20 years or so, 30 years, we're going to add another 2 billion people to the planet. How do we feed all of them? How do we feed them? well, you know, uh, and equitably across uh, the globe. Uh, I, I don't know how to do that. But I, I'll tell you that um, our crops and the ecosystem that supports the food production needs the animals and the, and the, and the trees and the microbes um, <clears throat> for the ecosystem to function. Uh, we have many of our crops that are pollinated by birds and insects and other animals. Seeds need to be dispersed. And so we need the rest of life to exist and thrive for us to thrive too. It, you know, it's not an either, you know, it's, it, it's not them or us. It, it, it has to be all of us together on this planet working together. We have to find solutions. And again, um, it's, it's me going out to the, some of these places and bringing it back and saying, you, you have to listen. You have to listen to these places. Right. They're truly a marvelous uh, so I know most of your listing devices are in remote areas and not necessarily in urban areas. So I'm curious if you have, do you have any in urban areas? And if so, you know, how has that signature changed since COVID? I just, I, I just gotta ask, you know, because we went to this light switch moment in the middle of March, uh, activity, human activity slowed down yeah. in a way that no one could have forecast ever uh, on a single event globally, which is just fascinating. And you think of the, the amount of uh, airplanes that were not flying and trains that were not moving and people not moving. Did you have any any data or have you, have you been able to collect data or see data as the impact of that, not only directly and wherever the sensors are, but kind of a second order impact because of, you know, the, the, the lack of pollution and, and the other kind of human activity that just went down. I mean, certainly a lot of, a lot of memes on social media of all the animals yeah, yeah. coming back into the city, but I'm just curious to, if you have any data or any observations. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're part of a, a, actually a global study. There's a couple hundred of us that are contributing our data to what we call the Silent Cities Project. Uh, it's being coordinated out of Europe right now. Uh, so we uh, placed our sensors out in uh, different areas, uh, actually around uh, the West Lafayette area here in Indiana, um, near road crossings and that sort of thing, to be able to kind of capture that information. Uh, we have had in in this area here now, the 17 year study. So we do have studies that get into areas that uh, tend to be fairly urban. So we, we do have a lot of information. Um, I, I'll tell you, I, I don't need my sensors to tell me something that I already know and you suspect is true. Um, our, our cities were quiet, uh, much quieter during the COVID uh, uh, situation. And uh, you know, it's continued to kind of get a little bit louder you know, as we've kind of released uh, some of the uh, uh, the policies that uh, put us into in, into our homes, and and so yes, there is there is uh, a, a major change. Now there have been a couple of studies that just come out uh, that are pretty interesting. One which was in San Francisco, looking at the white crowned sparrow, and they looked at historical data that went back something like twenty years, and they found that uh, the birds in the cities were singing uh, much softer, 30% softer. Uh, really? And they, yeah, and they they um, would lower their frequency. So 
Um, the way sound works is, is that if you lower your frequencies, uh, that sound can travel farther. Uh, and, and so the males can now hear themselves twice as far, uh, just due to the fact that our cities are quieter. So it does have an impact on animals. Uh, truly, it does. Uh, there's, there's, uh, there were some studies back in um, uh, 2001 during September, uh, the September uh, the 9-11 uh, crisis as well where people were going out and kind of looking at data, acoustic data, and, and discovering that things were much quieter. Um, I'd be very interested to, to look at some of the data we have in our oceans. Um, to what extent are oceans quieter? Our oceans, uh, sadly, are the loudest part of this planet. It's, it's really noisy. Uh, sound travels five times farther. Um, generally, the noise is lower frequencies, and we have lots of ships. Uh, that are all over the planet in, in our oceans. And sea. So I'd really be interested in, in, in those kinds of studies as well. You know, to what extent is it, is it you know, impacting and helping our, our friends in, in the oceans? Right, right. Well, I was just going to ask you that question because I think a lot of people clearly understand sound in the air that surrounds us, but um, you talk a lot about sound in ocean and, and sound is an indicator of ocean health and and again, this, this concept of, of a chorus, you know, I think everybody's probably familiar with the sounds of the humpback whale, right? It got very popular and uh, we, we've, we've all seen and heard that, but you're doing a lot of research, as you said, in oceans and in water. And I wonder if you can, again, kind of provide a little bit more uh, color around that, because I don't think, you know, people, maybe we're just not that tuned into it, think of you know, the, the ocean or, or water as a rich sound environment, especially to the degree, as you're talking about, where you can actually start to really understand what's going on. Yeah, I mean, some of us think that uh, sound in the oceans is probably more important to animals than on, on, uh, on land, on the terrestrial side. Um, sound helps animals to navigate through complex uh, uh, waterways uh, and you know, find food resources. Uh, you can only use sight so far you know, underwater, especially when it gets to, you know, when uh, it gets to be kind of dark, once you get down to certain uh, levels. Uh, so there, many of us think that, that sound is probably uh, going to be uh, an important component to measuring the status of health in our oceans. That's great. Well, Brian, I really, I really enjoyed uh, this conversation. I really enjoyed your <laughs> TED talk, and now I've got a bunch of research papers I want to dig into a little bit more as okay. well. So it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating topic. But I, I think the most important thing that that you talked about extensively in your TED talk is really, you know, just taking a minute to, to take a step back from the individual perspective, appreciate what's around us, hear that information, and I think there's a real direct correlation to to the power of, of, of exascale, to the power of you know, hearing this data, processing this data, putting intelligence on that data, understanding that data um, in, in, in a good way, in a positive way, in an enlightful way, a spiritual way uh, even that we couldn't do before or we, you know, we just weren't paying attention. Like lift your nose out of your phone, yeah, please. It's right. all around you. It's been yeah. here the whole time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Jeff, I, I really encourage your viewers to kind of just go out and listen. As we, as we say, go out and listen and join the mission. I love it. And you can get started by going to the, the Center for Global Soundscapes and you have a beautiful landscape. I had it going uh, earlier th this morning while I was <laughs> digging through some of the research. So Brian, <laughs> thank you very much and, uh, much, and really enjoy the conversation. Best to you okay. and your team and your continued success. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. All right, Bye -bye. he's Brian, I'm Jeff. You're watching the Cube. <laughs> for continuing coverage of Exascale Day. Thanks for watching, we'll see you next time.